Good afternoon. I think it's always incumbent on the last speaker of the day to say something provocative enough to get everyone engaged. So I will try to do that. Um, for those of you that I'm still getting to know, uh, Ethan Bernstein, I study roughly speaking the sharing of information and how it affects performance, learning, and innovation within organizations. And as you can see by the title, the long title and punctuated title, um, actually I look at it in the frame of do we see too much sometimes? In the, in the trend towards transparency, does sometimes boundaries actually provide us with some degree of performance? And I hope today to introduce some relatively new work, um, although I will base it on some of the work that I've published recently. So just by a show of hands, and this is not a test, how many of you have, are familiar with the ASQ article, the Transparency Paradox, I published last year? Oh, good. So uh, for those of you, I can cold call you, I guess. And for the rest of you, um, I, will, uh, I will actually start there. Um, actually, no, I don't think I'll start. I'm going to shorten the presentation a little bit. You saw the agenda there. I'm going to make it shorter. And Brian's not here to appreciate this, but I, during the break, I actually threw all the slides on the floor and put uh, <laughs> <laughs> them in a different order. So we'll see how that goes. This is an organization, uh, I can actually make that a little bigger, uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit today. And for the doctoral students in the room, when I took this from the organization I will tell you about in a second, and took it to my mentor, uh, Richard Hackman, who also sadly passed away this year. Um, Richard's first comment to me was, why are you showing this to me? I don't see any teams. And since we're a group of network scientists and team scientists, I thought that might be an interesting place to start the talk. So Richard's the definition of a team, and many others, is bounded and stable set of individuals independently working for a common purpose. And I actually think the, the, um, the bounded word is the one where I want to focus. Because as, is there a way to get the yeah, lights on without the, those yeah. I can go to this level. Hit the computer. That's a little bit dark. Can you still see me? Yes. We have light. You just don't. Right. So the bounded is where I'd like to sort of focus, and and I do so with a with a bit of background in history. So and this comes from um, Hector's work. We've been over a, a set of eras. Go back a couple hundred years, we primarily interacted through markets. That was exchange, and it was basically one person interacting with many. Lots of connections, but relatively little information going across them, primarily price information. We built bureaucracies so that we would actually get fewer connections, but we do so with thicker ties. And we're working towards now a world where collaboration, I think that's actually been much, much of what we've talked about today, where collaboration takes place where we try to have thick ties in lots of them at the same time and do so sometimes outside of the typical constraints of bureaucracy. And that's, generally speaking, followed this pattern where we're now focused on intelligence, where before we were trying to optimize for effort and scale it, and before that, resources. And the last two steps on this are where I think that question around boundaries really matters, and so that's what I'll talk about a bit today. But it also, it also parallels some of the movement from nouns to verbs that we've been seeing. So we've gone from leaders to leading. Amy's taken us from teams to teaming. We talk about less about knowledge today, more about knowing. And much of that is because we're taking, I think, the constraints of the boundaries of a, of a typical organization and trying to instead collaborate across multiple fields. And Heidi's work, which Lonnie even mentioned today, is very much about that. So that takes me then to transparency, because part of what gets us from that organization that's sort of closed off and the collaboration that's very open is some degree of information sharing and transparency, which for two, three, four centuries was defined as perviousness to light. And only in the last 15 years has been defined instead as openness and freedom of information. And for those of you who've seen my article, I define it as sort of a combination of the two accurate observability. But I want to take the accurate away right at this moment and instead just talk about observability and compare that to the bounded and stable set of individuals independently working for a common purpose. And hopefully, that's enough to convince you that it's worth thinking about how we structure boundaries in our organizations, whether it's a multi-team system, um, or whether it's simply that we're trying to build teams, and we're wondering 
where we should draw the boundary on that network graph that I started with. I'm going to do it actually in a very different context. I'm going to do it and I'm going to ask the question to enhance others' performance in organizations. When should we observe others and when should we not? Most of us, if I hadn't sort of primed you, would have said I'd like to see everything all the time. But if I were to instead ask you when should we be observed? Oh, well, I, I don't need to be observed. Actually, I'm, I'm just fine, thank you very much. And yet, that asymmetry is problematic from a theory perspective. And I'm going to do that work here. Um, in fact, I did that work here. Going all the way to China, the Pergola of the Delta, you'll find an organization that has 65,000 workers in these two plots of land, 150 acres, 3.1 million square feet of land, two dozen buildings, and actually the ones we're going to care about here where they make roughly 1 million mobile devices per week, at least when I was there. That is maybe 1 out of 10 cell phones sold in the world, if cell phones are defined as mobile devices, because the first summer I was there, there were cell phones the second summer mobile devices. And why am I telling you about all this? Well because I spent a lot of time with these folks. <laughs> Another note for doctoral students, when you're picking a field site, if you're a field researcher, pick one that's either close or with good weather. I did, <laughs> I did neither of the two. Um, 20 people on these lines, 32 lines across the entire floor, making roughly 2,000 units per shift. And we're going to talk primarily about 3G USB data cards, so I thought you should actually know, again, this is the organization I showed you at the very beginning, what these lines look like. Um, they're making these, among other brands, uh, all OEM brands. And they're first taking in the little uh, circuit boards, putting them into the housing. Then they're going to uh, test the transmitter. They're going to scan it into the system. They're going to upload the firmware. They're going to laser engrave the EIN number on the device because everyone needs to have its own very uh, unique EIN, otherwise you end up with other people's phone calls. Uh, packaging, they'll take the packaging, they'll fold it up, they'll box it, and that's more or less the process. Sorry for talking quickly, but I keep track of time. Oh, <laughs> all right, so I'm, I'm, I've got to have to talk people faster. And I studied them in a number of ways. Um, among other things, I borrowed five undergrads from the campus who were born and raised in China and actually embedded them on these lines, so I learned an awful lot about it them that way, their per personal characteristics match well so that, in fact, um, the embeds were well accepted into this organization. No one knew any differently other than three out of 14,000 people that were in this part of the, of the factory. And I won't talk as much about the qualitative work because I don't have time. The, I'm happy to distribute the paper for those who are interested. But I would just say that you probably didn't notice that was one of them. So that was one of the embeds standing right there on that line. And so we got a lot of qualitative data that essentially came down to the fact that despite the fact that this was an extremely transparent floor, extremely transparent, they were within the first three hours trained on two ways of doing things. One way of doing things when someone was watching and one way of doing things when someone wasn't. That may not be novel to you, but what was novel is that the way of doing things when someone wasn't watching was far more effective. In fact, boundaries in this case, or the absence of them, was dam were damaging productivity. Boundaries would have been better. And so I went back to actually test that. Would boundaries be better? And here's all of the, uh, the 16, uh, 32 lines, 16 day, 16 night. Here are two lines that were a little bit too close together. We were going to try all sorts of different kinds of interventions. You can imagine network interventions. You can imagine social psychology interventions. You can imagine all sorts of cultural interventions you might try. To do so, these two lines randomly chosen were a little too close, so we put up a curtain between the two, and that ended up being the intervention because standing next to one of these embeds, someone said, wow, that's pretty cool. Wouldn't it be great if we had a curtain around our entire line? We could be so much more productive if we did that. And being a student of qualitative researchers who believe that you listen to the field site when it tells you something, that's more or less what we did. So here's the site before the curtains, and here's what it looked like after in a field experiment, monitoring performance to find this defect reproduction on the line. And what do I find? Well, let me take you through the entire sort of thought process before I hit the, the bottom line. Well, maybe I won't. Uh, mm -hmm. See, that comes with shuffling the, the deck before you go in. Uh, the workers say 
that the productivity improvement, which I'm going to just tell you, is 10 to 15 percent on this simple, simple back end assembly, back end assembly task over the course of five months was the privacy that they needed to get their work done. And I add to that a definition of privacy. I, by the way, have a law background as well, so that helps with drawing on this research, which hasn't existed, as far as I know it, in the management sciences, has primarily existed in philosophy and jurisprudence. The ability to control and limit physical, interactional, psychological, and informational access to the self or one's group. So I'll come back to that last part because, again, that gets to the question of boundaries. But to, to speak to the, the way that this was working, which is framed as a transparency paradox, the way the workers described it to us and the way we ended up describing it, there are really two ways of hiding things. Either I shut the door so you and I can have a conversation or some group of us can have a conversation without being watched, or we encrypt our communication such that even though you're standing right in front of me, you have no idea what Nash and I are saying, which might happen more frequently than we do. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and that actually is just symbolized here by a QR code that, that would mean the transparency paradox where you'd be able to take your cell phone and, and run it over there to encrypt it. When we talked about moving from private to transparent, we talked about moving on this diagonal. We want it to be fully transparent. We being whoever the designers are, whoever the managers are. <coughs> I argue that that ignores <coughs> the agency of whoever it is that's being observed. So that those people, whoever they might be, or us, if we're the ones being observed, then make a choice about whether or not we code our activity. Or if we don't code our activity because actually we're being given the chance to able to be private behind closed doors. And not that we always want to be. Sometimes we want to be watched. Even these workers sometimes want it to be watched, but sometimes they do. And so if it's a choice between coded activity and behind closed doors, and I put curtains up, I essentially move the organization from the upper right, your upper right, to the lower left. And I do so then with a 10 to 15% performance improvement. And so that's what I'm claiming in this case happened with the curtains in terms of you know, just literally describing the performance difference. But that left a lot of people unhappy because it doesn't in the paper describe the mechanism. And so that's where I wanted to take you today in the, in the final eight minutes. Eight minutes. Um, so this was a, always an interesting quote that came directly from the workers. The curtain made our line more like a team, so the full production could be a teamwork. I, I translated it directly, so You'll have to excuse the, uh, you excuse the English. Um, and, and that paired with a survey that we ran where I tested all the things I thought might be going on. I thought it might be a motivational aspect. I, I used Amy's team psychological safety as we did exactly. Um, I talked, asked them about resources for improvement, self-assessment capabilities, their communication network, lo lots of things that you might be interested to try that you were trying to understand what was going on, and did the survey, by the way, on both the experimental and the control lines before and during the experiment so I could do a difference and differences on it. Not much popped up. Certainly none of the instruments did as a whole. And so instead, um, sorry, this is just, I'm going to skip over that. This is what the survey looked like, for those of you in the room who might be able to read it. Um, instead, I came up with four or five <coughs> results that I would summarize as follows. If we do something that looks weird within the sight of others, I'm going to attract their attention. And sometimes I want to attract attention, and sometimes I don't. And the, the attraction of attention is not necessarily, it's not necessarily that I, I want to hide something bad. I just want to hide something that I'm not ready to share yet. And so if you think about this more generally, there are a couple ways that we hide from the attention of others or that we control attention. So now I'm going to go, if you will, if we started at macro and went to meso level, now I'm going to go micro for you for just a second. The attention literature says basically we have a couple options, about five. One, the person who's being, whose attention is being captured can restrain their own attention. We can restrain our curiosity. I'm not sure how good you all feel about restraining your curiosity. I'm terrible at it. We could explain and justify why. So somebody should say, why on earth are you doing something differently? Why is that? And you say, I, actually, that's a great innovation, Steve. And, and here's why. And that conversation happens, but it's also very difficult 
have at a certain point in time where something, an idea is just really new and fresh. I don't think as a doctoral student I ran to my professors very often and said, here's a new idea that I had in the last five minutes, what do you think? Here's an idea I had 10 days ago, I've done nine days worth of thinking about it, here's what do you think? On the other side of this equation, the person who's doing it could just stop, which is actually what was happening on this line, which is what when people were walking around. You could reduce the field of view. That's what the curtains do. Or you could convince others to follow. And, and I would claim those five are sort of all, all in. And I'm going to run into time, so I'm going to keep moving forward quickly. I'm just going to put all this up. How that works, to some extent, I would argue, determines the orientation of a team or an organization. Whether we fall, and you can pick your, pick your side of this, of this um, slide, whether we're going to have a learning or control orientation, whether it's going to be exploration or exploitation, and so forth and so on down the line. And so if there is an asymmetry, and this is the key question, between the human capacity for self-regulation of <coughs> oneself. So if Andrea is the manager, and her ability to self-regulate her attention is not as good as my ability to regulate when she should be attending to me and when she shouldn't. If that makes a big if. Then selective opacities like these curtains, like the boundaries I put up with an organization <coughs> productive. And I'd say very quickly this, this draws on what I'm calling an attention driven view of, the, of organizational productivity, but that follows suit from people who've also <coughs> taken and used, and used the, the selective attention literature from the micro literature for macro purposes like Willie Acasio up the road, who's done it at the strategy level. Um, there are two ways of, there are two basic forms of attention, one executive control, one stimulus driven. So either I get to control my attention or it's captured for me by something in my peripheral view. This is very important for evolution. If there's a fire in the corner, you want to know about it. It may not be so good for organizational performance. I will skip over this only to say all of the work in this has been done in the lab that I know of. And so the question, how quickly can you figure out if there are more red dots or more green dots when you have something distracting you in one of these corners? And asking, how, what do I and do I not attend to in this picture when there are lots of people moving around is a very different question, but one that I would argue if we can go across multiple levels given the kind of people we have in the room we might be able to get to an interesting theory about. Um, it activates in the, in the micro literature, very different parts of the brain. That's probably true for managers and people in the management, management organization as well. So what does this all come to? Well, attentional focus can be preserved through self-regulation by the ego or boundaries to visual uh, um, observation. The research I call the, the field site Precision Mobile, um, suggests that the human ability to regulate attention may be asymmetrical. So at least in this case, managing by walking around destroyed value, which suggests to me that managers were not good at figuring out when they should and should not get involved in the, in the line itself. And I don't blame them for that because my curiosity would get the better of me as well. So if that's the case, then how organizational attention is negotiated will be a strategic and when looking where can, where can be productive, privacy boundaries may boost productivity. And for that matter, even when looking where it is not productive, some level of privacy may still boost, boost productivity because you don't get these heightened behaviors that may or may not, we can argue about it, be a natural component of being a human being wanting this level of privacy. And whether pri productivity or transparency is the goal, properly designed selective opacities may provide better results than stark observability remember was my goal in the first place was to convince you that as we think about boundaries, whether we're talking about networks or teams, that that is, is an important thing to keep thinking about and that just blowing past boundaries and making everything completely observable may actually have a negative performance. So I don't know if I've resolved that puzzle at all in this talk, but my hope was to at least highlight why I think it's important and to say again that at least in the case of this work um, and other work that I can talk about in the lab with you offline, that uh, the presence or absence of zones of groups of privacy by uh, 
attention, that's the mechanism I'm claiming here, weigh heavily on behaviors, thereby impacting productivity. I think I am out of time. So I'll stop simply with boundaries matter. Thank you. I think you put the fear of God in these speakers. Everybody is totally on time. Thank you very much, Ethan. And I see we have questions here, a couple in the back. Yeah, that's proof that I was provocative. Um, so, it, it, uh, it's, it's, um, it seems like you might, I'm not sure, it might, you might be assuming that the curtain is a one-way mirror, am I right? No, well, it's, not, it's a no-way mirror, I think. The, exactly. So in other words, it's not just that um, other people can't see in, but you also cannot see out. That's right. So how do we know that these effects are not due to the latter, that, and there could be two mechanisms involved. One is, just get distracted by seeing what other people are doing. So. Now you can't see them, so you might as well work, right? Instead of watching other people, sort of like watching TV or multitasking, and maybe as a sort of 1A version of that. But then another version would be the paper from a few years ago on explore exploit with the agent model, where you know you don't, you can't see what the other people are doing, so you don't imitate too soon. But that maybe that's too far fetched. I just thought I would throw out that connection because of of the past papers. Um, but uh, at any rate, I, my question really is, how do you know it's not all being driven by the inability to see the other, to see out? So the answer to that, so I answer that question and then I'll sort of answer the, the, the other one that you, you, yeah. you threw in front of me. Um, so I know that it's not just simply the lack of distraction uh, because that's what the folks inside the line told us. So they listed three four things that basically changed for them. One of them was an ability to focus, although they describe it both as because they're not seeing a whole lot of other people doing a lot of other things and because people aren't seeing them do things. Situated in the, in the, in the, in the universe of, that they lived in for just a moment, even if they clustered around a problem, three or four of them around a problem, that would bring attention. And sometimes they could solve problems far better just locally, because they were one-off problems. And that, it wasn't a matter of them being distracted, it was a matter of them distracting others who would then distract them. So, so that, that, that combined with, would combine with <coughs> an ability to focus on their own task. <coughs> to me, both of those things fall within the, the umbrella of attention. So I, I, I'm not suggesting that it's just one or the other. I would say it's both. It's both their attention and it's the attention of others as it, as it tends to them. You do sort of, am I right, that it's sort of framed more as me being observed and it's not equally, it's not a two-way street where it's 50% me not being observed and it's 50% <coughs> of others. No, it's, it's, you've got it at the power. You've got it almost all entirely on, if I'm understanding correctly, it's almost entirely on others can't see me. Yes, I, I do. Um, and that's, that's, so going back to the qualitative work at the beginning, certainly the reason why, and, and so I don't mean to put it at 100%. It's more two-thirds, one-third. Um, again, based on the qualitative work, but the, the, earlier stage before the curtains went up, when they changed the way they did things, when they knew someone was around, because of course, it's not just that everyone can see them, it's that they can see everyone. The effect was large at that point on performance. And so that, that to me is a suggestion that it's not simply, may, maybe you can make the argument they're spending so much of their effort monitoring for observation, that that was distracting for them, that that, that actually it should be closer to 50-50, but that, that was not my observation. I mean, when I want my daughter to do her homework, I turn off the TV. <laughs> so, so it's fair. Um, I'm actually I'm going to go back and reread read the, the transcript and see if I can. <laughs> to, to your second point about exploration and exploitation, so let's talk, let's just talk so offline, because um, I have the paper with David and Jesse that I think yeah. a bunch of people in the room have seen that, that furthers this notion, but with a different 
perspective that, that speaks to it. And that's also um, looking out, not looking. Because <laughs> um, I can't see what the other people did too early. And so I don't lock into it. Yes, that's right. Aren't they doing different things? Are the lines all doing the same thing? All of these 32 lines? Yeah. Yes. They're all making 3G USB data. <laughs> So, Ron, did you have a um, thing? I think it's my turn. Oh, sorry, I thought your your turn is Steve. So uh, a simple question though. Um, do you see? I have two parts. Do you see any parallels with the uh, the Horthman studies? And um, do you think there are any cultural boundaries here that are playing a role in what you observe? So on Hawthorne, uh, yes, but not for the reasons you're probably asking. Uh, so I actually do have a control for the Hawthorne effect, uh, which is the effect that if you're being observed, you better. If, you're knowing, if you know you're being researched, you perform better. In this case, the space provided me with a control. Because the day shift sort of knew something was going on. The night shift, for whatever reason, assumed it was all about the day shift. And yet they saw the exact same, well not exact same, but no significant difference in increase of performance relative to the day shift. That said, if you go back and read the archives from Hawthorne, you find the women in the in the room describing the yeah, the bank, the bank wiring, wiring room. bank wiring room. Thank you. Um, describing their experience as being more intimate, quieter, and you get the sense that they actually appreciated being closed off. Yeah, there was a sense of control over the environment that they, that they had. They had more influence on what was going on. So in that sense, yes, I do see a connection, and I see it as a positive one. Uh, the cultural question, I don't have the data to say yes or no. Um, it's not. For what it's worth, it's not a Chinese-owned factory. It's actually one of the top three global, global contract manufacturers. This is the second largest mobile phone factory in the world. Um, so practice-wise, I don't think it's cultural. But certainly, the workers were all um, Chinese. And so that may or may not have impacted. So when I see this, um, it occurs to me that Usually in a situation like this, there's what the boss tells you to do, and there's the manual. And if you do it that way, that's not nearly good as good as doing it your own way. Um, so that's a really, if that's true, that's a very obvious reason why productivity goes up when the boss is not around. And when the curtain is, it has nothing to do with attention. It has to do with the mismatch between the rules and what you actually do. So do you know what actually they did differently? And whether the things that they actually did differently met the standards that the bosses would normally have applied? So let's see. Yes, I know what they actually did differently, at least to a list of about 30, I, beyond a certain point. What, one can only ask a set sure. of undergrads to sit on a line for, or work on a line for so long before they get tired. So we, didn't, we were not there for the full five months of the Philly experiment, but I do know. Um, a, a fairly decent list. Um, yes, they were all within the standards of what um, the bosses would have wanted. Um, in fact, this organization claims to be a learning organization, claims to have adopted all the things in Toyota production system that, that one would want. Um, and the challenge <coughs> was that you were actually competing. It was a different competition in the arithmetic of these people's minds. It was a question, do I share it and have to explain it to whoever the line management or the engineer would have been, and therefore go through a fairly costly conversation, at least in terms of time, of, of explaining that and trying to get things adjusted. Or do I just do it and hide it, and everyone's happy. They don't need to spend the time, I don't need to spend the time, and we figure out if it's the right thing to do before I go ahead and share it later. And so this was actually, it wasn't, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a permanent thing. It's not as if I'm suggesting that these curtains were walled. They were fairly permeable. In fact, I think in the picture I showed you saw somebody from the management walking in. They walked in and walked out. It was exactly as you described, but it was solving for the, the loss of innovative ideas that happen because things have, sometimes get shared prematurely from their perspective. And in that sense, it was an attention thing because they weren't ready for the attention that they were going to draw if they, if they tried something that was always going to be a process improvement. Because to prototype something on this line meant to change the process a little bit. Does that 
Does that address your question, Sandy? Or I, I, yeah, I wouldn't describe it as attention. I would describe that as a process of passive learning, a process learning, and uh, an interventionist management that exacts a price uh, for having done something new. And so, yeah, you can have much more sort of learning and, and innovation when you don't have to, just what you said, when you don't have to be answering for it all the time. Uh, my, my experience with yep. Japanese man, with Chinese management is that, uh, yeah, it's a very expensive thing to explain to your boss what you're doing. At least until you've been able to try it for a little while. Uh, very authoritarian, very entitled. So remember, the management is not Chinese, not all of it. So the top level of this organization, the management would be Chinese. Line management. Line management. Yeah, yeah. For what it's worth, the, the only way this company makes money is if they learn over time. Yeah. Right? Generally speaking, these days, when a contract manufacturer bids on work, they'll bid below cost on the assumption that after ramp, they'll learn enough that they can actually make it back. Mm -hmm. So at least in theory, this was always supposed to be a learning organization. Whether it was, whether you're convinced that it was bad practices in management in the factory, or whether this is just a human endeavor, I guess does affect whether or not you see the curtain as being uh, valuable for the reason you describe, or valuable for the reason I describe. But I, I would claim, I would continue to claim, that at least from what I could tell, uh, they weren't too far off from the best factories I've seen. And that the curtains be, had this impact in part because of, of the ability to block visibility, and that was valuable for this limited amount of time because it kept attention from being automatically captured as soon as somebody did something different. So that, that's at least where I would come. So Ethan, the, um, the boundaries in your study encapsulated a line, right? So a collective. Can you speculate for a minute about the effects on attention and privacy and productivity? If this were a different situation, say people working from home, where they had privacy, um, but they weren't able to have that collective experience. So the, the bunny slippers question. Uh, what if I'm working at home in bunny slippers? Is that going to, yes, and, and you know, we all like bunny slippers, so uh, does that impact your productivity? So the, the more generally, I've framed this not as a question of should we have curtains, but when, for how long, who should be inside of them. I, I don't have any specific data on individuals. So most people want to know the question, does this mean we should all have offices? Because they want the answer to be yes. <laughs> uh, and, and I don't have anything more than speculation on that point. Uh, I do think that it was very important. So I think there were two very important reasons why this didn't backfire. One is that the productivity, the performance, was always transparent. So we took away transparency or observability of behavior. But I only know that it got better because I and everybody else were watching the, the, you know, every 30 seconds how many things had come off of the line. And the other thing I think that did matter was the fact that there was more than one person inside the curtain. So when we consider you know, another way to frame this work is what is the value of Slack? And how do you make Slack valuable as opposed to not valuable or the reverse um, in an organization? And I do think that the peer effect here matters. And so some of my work with a couple other co-authors talks about peer effects and how that affects performance. So on the, on the you know, person at home, I think that's a much harder one. Um, I, I, I know there are, there, there are people who have studied it more, much more than I have we'd actually point in that direction. Uh, but that would be my, that would be why I would copy up this, this work. Okay. Um, I want to pick up on a point that Steve, on, on a point that Steve raised. A couple years ago, we had a fellow over to the workshop uh, from um, the law school, uh, Lior Strahilovitz, and he has a networks theory of privacy uh, that was in the University of Chicago Law Review. Uh, so we were curious to see what does this have? Um, and it has an interesting implication for this, I think, and that I want to get the benefit of your thought because you're an insider on this. His point was, when do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? And there's a lot of argument back and forth on this. And he would use the network to predict what your reasonable expectation is. 
the more open and connected the network, the less expectation you have, because everybody's going to find out. One can then take this into your factory and say, the burden of being seen is because of the expectation of being seen. And if you were to run this on New Yorkers who don't care if the guy next to them drops dead, uh, it, it really wouldn't get the same effect. And the, the reason why I bring that up then is um, the link that the inferences about cognition and, and generalizability may be dangerous. Uh, that it may be linked to the kind of network you work in uh, uh, much more than it's linked to cognitive processes. Do you have a sense of this? So the, be the benefit of being at the, I think the only um, new faculty assistant professor presenting is that I can say that's what the next eight years are for. <laughs> um, so, so I actually, I actually, so I actually do think it's it's important um, to frame it that way. When I when I've talked about this work, <coughs> many people feel like it relates to them in ways that suggest to me that it's not totally limited to the cultural habitat that I was studying. Don't confound the charm of the deliverer with the content. I, I would think you could sell iced uh, Eskimo. I was, gonna, I, was, I was about to say, actually, I think that would go the other direction. It would make the, the effect even stronger. Um, <coughs> there are, you know, I, I spent, I'll just talk, I'll talk to personal experience. Right? Back, back, when I, back when I worked in the real world, um, I, I was a consultant. And we'd always talk about, you know, who created the killer slide on a particular project. And very rarely was the killer slide produced according to protocols, um, exactly as it had been planned. So, so there's something about being able to close the door with a set of more junior individuals without observation and you, and you get to, I don't know if it's more innovation with a small eye or with a big eye or, or what it might be, but there's something about that. Um, I'm thrilled to hear about the Networks article in the University of Chicago Law Review. I, I haven't actually seen it, so now I'm going to have to look it up. I would say, for those of you who haven't read, have the benefit of reading a lot of articles about privacy um, in law journals, Lawyers are far more interested in reasonable expectations of privacy than they are in instrumental value of privacy. Um, and actually, there's a lot of people on the transparency side who also feel that way. They're much more about the, they're much less about the value of it and much more about we should have it. Um, I have borrowed, had to borrow actually very carefully from both literatures because I truly wanted to focus on the instrumental value, the performance value. Um, I live within a business school, we tend to care more about performance hypotheses. Uh, but it's fascinating to hear that someone has used networks to predict that. Um, and there may be some interesting parallels because it might parallel the whole. Thank you, that's wonderful. They have a question? Yeah. Um, sorry, just a follow up on that. I was actually thinking about that because you were really doing that in very particular kind of settings. It's in China and based on my own knowledge, I don't know of this particular uh, in, uh, plant, but uh, really, this kind of manufacturing factories in China, those workers there are migrant workers who left them homes and they stay in dorms together. And I would think they would have really strong informal networks among them and they would, they would have a uh, low expectation about their own privacy. And secondly, my own experience is um, Chinese are more obedient to central authority or the collective. So I, my own experience opinion is Chinese are more, that is to say, Chinese care less about the pri privacy in the workspaces than Westerners. So I, I, I don't know if that would have an effect on what you're trying to say. I, I don't know if it would because again, it's, it's, it's about the expectations as opposed to the value. Um, that said, a couple, of, a couple of just facts about this particular site. So with, with, with 14,000 workers, um, really a, relatively a quarter of whom will turn over every year or more. People were constantly coming and going. So actually the allocation to lines and the allocation to dorms were not at all coexistent. So the people you were living with and the people you were working with, um, it was a big enough facility, those would be different people. Now whether or not that changes how much you care about the privacy on the line, I don't know. Um, but it, it, it wasn't that the connection, it wasn't that you were always having lunch and, and sharing a, a dorm room uh, with the people that you were working with, just because of the nature of, of the facility. Um, but I, 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 I take your, actually your perspective on it is obviously a, a more educated one than many respects than mine. Um, and 
I can't, I can't say more than my new work suggests that this is more generalizable than, than simply a question of, of an effect in China. Well, but with this interpretation, would it be that it's the uh, shielding from uh, management observation? I mean, if the manager, yes, they can come in, but they've got to go through the curtain. It's very obvious. And uh, I've never been in one of these plants, but I, I have been to China a few times. And management, particularly the low level, they tend to just walk around a lot looking. They don't help out. They don't fix problems. They just walk around observing. So I wouldn't want to be observed. So I, I wonder if, you know, I mean, there's the more general attention, but I wonder if it's not somewhat more focused on that kind of observation. So it's again, it's we're just speculating, but so it's interesting, and I framed it that way. Um, in truth to the data, when we asked, for example, about um, well, actually, I, we asked most of the questions I mentioned, but especially about the psychological safety pieces, we asked about various different constituencies, and to the extent that it changed, so the helpfulness I think I mentioned is the one that matters the most. When it came to who was helpful and who was not, it wasn't just senior, it was also peers on other lines that they felt imposing upon them. Uh, because remember, I, I had to put this curtain in the first place because the lines were too close together. Um, the, the fact that you were looking out and someone else was looking in also had an impact here. So it wasn't just managerial um, impact. I would also say that I, I put one embed into the um, indirect labor pool because I wanted to know how that worked and I did not sense that that the reality matched that perception in this plant. Um, I have been to other plants, uh, this is by the way not Foxconn just to be clear, um, I've been to other plants where it was far more all of the things that I think come into your mind when you think of Chinese factory. Many of the workers who were here had actually been to multiple other factories in the Pura Pura of Delta and landed here because it had a reputation for being the best place to work. Um, and part of that was because it was more, it was more like what we might expect um, a good, not actually much better than a bad factory, a good factory um, here to be like. But again, it's, it's an open question. While we're getting Mike to Connie, I'll ask you a question. Yeah, as as I, I look at what you're doing here, I, um, I'm struck at how much we talk about it in privacy versus not privacy, and yet what we saw is it is a group that had fewer observers, but they still, each individual wasn't private relative to the group. <coughs> and you see you've read a lot of literature on privacy. To what extent is it really treated as a, as a concept that is really a continuum, and that it's important to know kind of what some of those cut points are, where it makes a difference? So it's interesting. The, um if you were to track the philosophy and, and jurisprudential literature on privacy over time, you'd see a, a sort of a core skeleton that always includes group as one of the two, you know, self or group, as, as sort of where, where it matters. But then we, the, the, the bones off of the skeleton have very often shifted more towards the individual. Because I think that's where people are just more interested to have conversations. And it's also easier, quite frankly, it's easier data to get. Um, because groups are more expensive to study. So th that, that groups have been less, um, less treated by the, by the privacy literature, but they certainly are non, not non-existent. In part, I think, because of the dichotomy I've put up here around groups have, all, have been at least framed as needing boundaries to exist, and those boundaries often are visibility boundaries and therefore relate to the privacy literature. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested in thinking of privacy more as a continuum, and that's kind of why I asked the question. But I had a second question. Okay. Is I, I couldn't tell from the picture, were these all women working in the factory? No. It was mixed groups? Uh, it's, so they, they recruit, they recruit, um, and it was actually, as with most factories in the Pearl River Delta, this was a time period that was actually shifting. Um, it was still, at this time, a majority women but it was coming closer to you. Because okay, I would think that would be effective and influence uh, perceptions of privacy as well. And perhaps collective intelligence, so. All right. <laughs> Connie, last question. Uh, well, it's not a question, but mainly maybe a comment uh, about whether uh, the effect you observe in your study is cultural or not. And I was talking to uh, a professor at Cornell who is in architectural design, 
and they said like open floor design has been you know the trend recently. Uh, well, I mean maybe last year, including at Facebook, they want to you know environment where it's open for creativity, communication. But I think a reason there's a trend reverse, saying like open floor plan actually reduce productivity, and they're on TED. Uh, open floor design will produce, so yeah. which actually consistent, consistent with what yeah. you found here. So I wonder, you know, the study uh, on TED in uh, April this year, there's like a, a stat, um, there is a 66% decrease <coughs> productivity, but I don't know uh, how academic the study was like, whether it's rigorous or not, but I, I'm just wanna, just want to mention this to you. Great. This may not be cultural, it, it may be common, and also in Asian culture, Open floor design is not a unique, and there was a 2006 in academy management perspective. Uh, there was a report about a guy at Toyota, um, you know, that's still the open floor design that people they are hated it because it's really the for management to uh, coerce and control the norm, like you observing other people and you know, check over the other people's shoulder, which make people uncomfortable. That can reduce. So just something to share with you, not necessarily a question. No, thank you for the, I, I didn't, I don't know about the TED Talk, so I will look it up. Um, and certainly on the course of enabling the, the all Adler Boris kind of work, it's, you know, it's a continuum. Um, but I, I actually think in this case, the plant was on the enabling side. It would be a lot harder for me to say that if Toyota were still the company it had been until about, what was it, 2006. Um, but Toyota itself has had trouble doing what Toyota says that they want to do. And I think part of that is because there is something just sort of, there is something generalizable about this effect, where even if you tell people and you build a transparent culture, they, they talk about a culture of transparency, you still, if you have that observability, you still trigger in people a response that it's not necessarily effective. So, so thank you for both of those. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. you.